take part in today's event. Um, K. Balgopal was somebody who played an exemplary role in the defense of human rights, democratic rights, civil liberties in India. And in many ways, the topic that uh, I've been asked to speak on today, which is on surveillance, uh, goes to the heart of uh, many of the human rights concerns. Of course, in a, in a different fashion, many of the uh, technologies and means used to subject citizens to surveillance and also uh, you know, the manner in which this is happening uh, perhaps were unheard of 10, 20 years ago. But the essential impulse driving the surveillance activities of the Indian state are exactly the same impulses which are propelling a whole host of rights violations. So in that way, surveillance and the means to which, or the uses to which surveillance are put by the Indian state today uh, uh, are very much an essential part of any meaningful discussion on, on human rights and the challenges to human rights. So thank you very much for um, asking me to speak today and for selecting this topic. Uh, before I, I speak, uh, it, it, it's my central, the central thesis of my talk today is that uh, surveillance as deployed by the Indian state is, is not simply a question of violating an individual citizen's right to privacy. By phrasing it in that way, I don't mean to minimize the importance of the right to privacy. I think every individual regards her or his right to privacy as a central part of, of their being, central part of their human rights. And the Supreme Court of India in Puttaswamy has recognized the right to privacy as an essential part of the right to life. So I don't mean to minimize this very essential right when I say that surveillance is not simply a violation of privacy rights. What I mean to say is that surveillance as deployed by the Indian state today goes well beyond violating the rights of the individuals who have been subjected to surveillance and actually represents an assault on the democratic rights of everybody. And the reason I, I say this, and the reason I think it's important to say this and to recognize this is because at one level, there is a tendency to make light of some of the disclosures and revelations that have come in the past month or two about surveillance and to say, well, do we really need to worry so much about spyware, Pegasus, surveillance? After all, it's only a handful of people who are being subjected to surveillance. Or you have persons connected to the ruling establishment who suggest the only people who need to worry about surveillance are those who have something bad to hide. So there is this tendency to make light of the problem of surveillance by saying, oh, this is just a problem of a few individuals and what's the big deal? And the starting point of my analysis today is that this is a very big deal because surveillance has deployed represents an assault on citizens as a whole, even if their own devices and phones 
have not been hacked into, even if they themselves as individuals are not subjected to surveillance. There is a wider issue of uh, assault on their rights, which we need to focus on. And before I go into the specifics of the, the, the form that surveillance takes today, or the most extreme form that surveillance takes today, I want to establish the context, which is that over the past seven years, since 2014, this country has been subjected to a sustained systematic assault on democratic institutions of the kind that we have perhaps not seen for the past 70, 75 years. And I say this despite the fact that the country went through a formal emergency between 75 to 77. That assault lasted two years. Of course, during those two years, the measures taken by the government against the people in some regards was much more repressive than what we see today, much more uh, far reaching. But it was a two year period. And there were, of course, many, many differences between some of the measures taken during the emergency and what we see today in what many call an undeclared or unrecognized emergency. But the key difference to bear in mind is that we are looking at a seven year long assault and one that appears to be intensifying with each passing year and which is taking forms of repression, maybe because they are not so overt are therefore far more insidious, far more dangerous. But, the, but my talk is not primarily focused on the assault on democracy as a whole. I spoke about this last week at a, at a session virtual session organized by the Manthan Forum in Hyderabad, where I looked at the overall assault taking place on different institutions of democracy, different on, on the media, of course, on, on the for, on parliamentary practice, on, on, on every, every institution which is supposed to provide the citizen with the ability to hold the authority, the authorities in check. Uh, that assault is happening. So I don't want to repeat what I said in that lecture, but it's important to bear that in mind as context. That in the last seven years, you have a government which has uh, a sweeping majority in the Lok Sabha and uh, has used its power in order to weaken and whittle away uh, every possible source of opposition, whether it be in parliament, whether it be from different institutions, whether it be the media. And that is the context in which we need to consider the consequences of the kind of surveillance techniques that this government has employed. In other words, we are looking at a situation where you have a government that is more powerful than any that we have experienced in the last 70 years, that faces less challenge inside parliament or outside, less opposition or challenge from the media, less pushback from constitutional institutions, and yet this government feels the need to arm and equip itself with uh, added weapons so as to ensure that its power literally goes completely unquestioned and unchallenged. 
So this, I feel, the fact that surveillance techniques are being employed as a tool of political domination, the fact that this is happening uh, when a government already enjoys the kind of power that it does, makes the situation even more dangerous and difficult for the rest of us. That's what I wanted to say by way of setting the political tone and background of uh, uh, India as a surveillance state. Now, in 2019, a number of people in India received messages from WhatsApp and from a North American based laboratory called Citizen Lab, informing them that their phones had been hacked into or been targeted for hacking by some unidentified hacker or unidentified agency using an, an Israeli spyware called Pegasus. We know from a letter that WhatsApp wrote, WhatsApp is, as you know, social media company owned by Facebook. And we know from a letter that WhatsApp wrote to the government of India's uh, computer emergency response team or CERT in, in, in 2019, that around 120 or 121 Indians or people living in India were the targets of spyware. And according to an answer provided in parliament by the then IT minister, I believe it was Ravi Shankar Prasad or his deputy, sometime in November or December 2019, something like 20 of those phones uh, actually had, uh, I mean, WhatsApp had evidence or, or proof of uh, data being added or taken away, some kind of active surveillance using Pegasus. Now, this was a problem that WhatsApp identified as having occurred in the in a 12-day period from roughly March 21st or 22nd, 2019, up to April 2nd or 3rd, 2019. So for a, in a 12-day window, WhatsApp said it detected something like 1,400 cases worldwide, of which 120 were in India, where Pegasus appears to have either been uh, successfully used or attempted to be used against these people. In deference to the privacy concerns of its uh, customers, WhatsApp didn't reveal the names <coughs> of those Indians who had been targeted, but something like 20 or 21 people came forward to say that they had been notified by WhatsApp. And this list is in the public domain. Many of them wrote to the uh, Standing Committee of Parliament for Information Technology, headed by Shashi Tharoor, uh, demanding an inquiry. Many of them wrote to the government, demanding that uh, some answers be given to them. And uh, these targets include a host of human rights activists, Anil Tel Tomre, many of those who were uh, targeted in the Bhima Koregaon case, many activists in Chhattisgarh, uh, all, of, all of them, in other words, connected in some way or the other to the struggle for the human rights of people in India. And uh, the government, when asked about this in parliament, essentially pretended as if it had nothing to do with its own functioning and said, well, we have written to WhatsApp asking for, for more information. This is when uh, Pegasus as a spyware entered the public domain in India. And we knew for a fact that um, around 120 people had been targeted using this spyware. Now, a word about 
what Pegasus is and who makes it. Pegasus is military grade spyware made by an Israeli company called NSO Group. This is a company that was set up by um, Israeli, former Israeli military intelligence people who had developed uh, communication interception technologies while serving with the Israeli military or the Israeli intelligence. And when they left the Israeli military, they set up a private company where they developed these surveillance techniques. And essentially what this involves is the hacking, finding a way to hack into the smartphone of a target so that you can implant your spyware on this phone. And once you successfully do that, you can essentially break into all communication of your target, not just uh, calls that are placed over a cellular network or SMSs, which is the kind of surveillance which uh, the government of India or any government uh, would attempt to do through lawful means. So in India, for example, under the IT Act and under the earlier Telegraph Act of the 19th century. There is a prescribed procedure by which uh, the government of India can place telephone numbers under surveillance and obtain recordings or messages sent and exchanged through the telephone network. Now this refers to unencrypted messages uh, or phone calls placed by, by uh, targets. And there is a prescribed procedure for this. The, if, if it's the Union of India, which is doing it, the Home Secretary has to, has to authorize surveillance. This is for a limited period of time. There is sadly no judicial oversight, but nevertheless, there is some kind of official mechanism which the Supreme Court has insisted governments have to follow. What Pegasus does is that it fills a vital gap in the intelligence agency's attempts to obtain information from a target, which is that with the, with the rise of internet telephony and the use of encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram, because these messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, even if the government of India's agencies use lawful interception methods. Obtain the, and, and the procedure is very simple. You have to obtain the assistance of the telecom or internet service provider so that you can patch into messages or phone calls as they are being exchanged. But since these messages say on WhatsApp or Signal are encrypted and WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram refuse to share an iMessage, I, uh, Apple refuses to share the encryption key with the government of India, uh, it is no use for them to get hold of these encrypted messages as they are being sent back and forth. What Pegasus does is that it helps intelligence agencies uh, read even encrypted messages because it opens for the Pegasus operator uh, a window into everything that your phone does. So literally the screen that you as a target are watching is replicated on the computer screen of the person who has deployed Pegasus against you. So all your encrypted messages are no longer secret. However, Pegasus goes one step further. It can activate the microphone on your phone, it can activate the camera. The operator can get your phone to secretly video record or audio record without your knowledge and then transmit the recordings made secretly back to the operator. In short, it gives government or whoever has deployed Pegasus against you full visibility full access to everything that you do, everything you say, everything you see, conversations you have either on the phone or in person, if you carry your phone with you. 
and it provides unprecedented access into the life of an intended target. Now, in 2019, the government of India kind of pretended that it knew nothing about this. It said, well, we have written to WhatsApp asking for more details. I believe the minister also said that we have written to NSO, the Israeli company. However, a recent right to information request made to the IT ministry asking for a copy of that communication, both to WhatsApp and NSO, uh, produced a two-line email that was sent to WhatsApp. And there is no record that has been shared so far by the government with a right to information applicant about what exactly is it that the government of India wrote to NSO group about. And my hunch is that the government of India perhaps never bothered to write to NSO. And there was a very good reason why it didn't do that. Now, fast forward from 2019 to 2021. Uh, my colleague MK Venu and I were approached by a French-based uh, media nonprofit called Forbidden Story sometime in March 2021 with the information that they had a database of numbers uh, of actual or potential Pegasus victims. Our numbers were on that list. And they asked us whether we would agree to have our phones examined forensically in order to authenticate whether, in fact, we have been targeted by Pegasus or not. Both of us agreed. We uploaded uh, a backup of our phone, uh, the, some of the data. And this was analyzed by Amnesty International's tech lab. And uh, the Conclusion came back that both phones were indeed infected with Pegasus. And Forbidden Story said that according to their database, there were more than a thousand Indian numbers. And would the wire be interested in joining an, an international media consortium of um, different newspapers and media platforms around the world that were investigating? Um, the use of Pegasus worldwide. And we readily agreed. Our work in, on the project began in May and we had roughly a month and a half to examine and investigate uh, thousand plus numbers, try to understand who these numbers belong to, try to approach uh, the owners of these numbers in order to see whether they would cooperate with our story and agree to have their phone forensically examined. And I won't bore you with the details. This was a, this was a difficult uh, task journalistically because we also had to preserve confidentiality and secrecy during this entire period to make sure that the government of India or any other agency uh, did not find out what we were doing. To cut a long story short, of the thousand plus numbers that we had, we were able to positively identify uh, a few hundred. And we approached roughly 50 odd people with a request that they allow us to forensically examine the contents of their phone. Uh, of the 50 people that we approached, roughly 21 or 22 people agreed to do that. And we were able to conduct a forensic examination on their phones. So that's basically around, I think, 20, 21 or 22 phones. And we were able to establish with the cooperation of Amnesty International that around 14 or 15 phones out of the 21 or 22 that we forensically examined either had evidence of a Pegasus infection or showed uh, evidence of an attempted Pegasus infection. And of these um, infected phones, several belonged to journalists. I already mentioned that my phone and MK Venu's phones were uh, positively infected and we, we established this through forensic ex uh, examination. 
but also Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, SNM Abadi, um, Sushant Singh, former defense editor of the uh, Indian Express, a uh, couple of human rights activists, but also the well-known opposition political strategist Prashant Kishore. When we examined his phone, we found the presence of Pegasus uh, going back more than two years, but most worryingly, Pegasus had been deployed and we saw this through the forensic footprint. Pegasus had been deployed against Prashant Kishore's phone during the West Bengal election campaign of 2021. Apart from the phones that we forensically examined and found actual traces of Pegasus in, there were dozens of phones of political people, business people, human rights people, whose phones could not be uh, tested or examined for a variety of reasons. But we have strong reason to believe their, the presence of their numbers or the numbers of their associates on our database is strongly indicative of their probable targeting by Pegasus. And among the people included in this list, the then president of the Congress, Rahul Gandhi, two senior politicians of the Bharati Janata Party who are today ministers, Prahlad Patel and Ashwini Vaishnav, who is in fact the information and technology and communications minister today. He was then just a businessman when he was targeted in 2017 and 2018. Uh, the former election commissioner, Ashok Lavasa, his name was on that, his number was on the list. Um, a number of lawyers, a number of employees of the Supreme Court registry. We also found the number of a young woman who in 2019 had accused the sitting Chief Justice of India, Ranjan Gogoi, of sexual harassment and of unleashing a vendetta against us. It turned out that this young woman, her husband, her brother-in-law and other relatives, something like eight or nine numbers associated with her were all on the database. And the period roughly coincided with the time that she went public with her allegations against Ranjan Gogoi. So this was a very, very broad range of targets. And the question which, of course, we sought to answer was who is it who has subjected these broad range of individuals to surveillance? Who deployed Pegasus against them? We wrote to the government of India as part of our Pegasus project, uh, mentioning that we had this database, mentioning that we had done forensics on a number of phones, mentioning that we had identified a number of individuals whose phones appeared to have been targeted and so on, and asking the government of India whether they had any information on this. The uh, PMO directed our inquiry to the Ministry of Information Technology, which replied to us about a day or two before we published on July 18th broadly denying that any of the people on our list had been subjected to surveillance by the government of India. And then you had the ministry reiterating its claims that all surveillance in India is conducted lawfully and so on and so forth. In my view, this reply by the government of India is very hard to believe for the simple reason that this spyware, Pegasus, is only sold by the Israeli company NSO Group to governments. So if we found evidence of Pegasus on a number of phones in India, and we asked the question, who has used Pegasus against these people? We can very confidently say that it is a government somewhere that has targeted these guys. Not some private company, not some private individual, not some criminal um, uh, syndicate. It is 
a government or a government agency because nso group exports of pegasus are vetted by the israeli government which grants the, the israeli ministry of defense grants an export license and nso has said in court depositions in america because facebook and whatsapp have taken nso to court in america because of the 2019 use of pegasus against whatsapp users worldwide that i mentioned nso has informed the california court on oath that it only sells pegasus to governments so we can say with 100% certainty that the targeting of prashant kishore and mind phone and mk venu and everybody else was done by a government or a government agency that's point number 1 Point number two. Okay, which government? We know that the database contains roughly fourteen hundred numbers that are in India, and the same client also selected several hundred numbers in Pakistan. So you have to ask which government. one of those numbers incidentally as was reported by the guardian and le monde one of those numbers belong to the prime minister of pakistan imran khan so which government has an interest in deploying pegasus against indian journalists indian political figures indian human rights activists the young woman who accused chief justice ranjan gogoi of sexual harassment as well as against imran khan and targets in pakistan now over the past week there was a very interesting judgment from the uk high court on a matter concerning the use of pegasus against the former wife of the ruler of dubai the ruler of dubai was going through a messy divorce his wife princess haya is in the uk and our project found that her phone had been targeted with pegasus and the uk high court essentially took that on board there was a whole full fledged hearing the uk court concluded that she was indeed targeted with pegasus and said on the basis of who had the greatest interest in princess haya her lawyers her associates as well as others who appear to have been targeted and came to the conclusion that it was most likely the ruler of dubai and some kind of government agency in the in dubai or uae which used pegasus and that it was inconceivable that any other government agency would have had an interest in subjecting such a range of characters to this kind of surveillance over a sustained period and i think using the same logic looking at the range of targets if you ask yourself which government would have an interest in targeting prashant kishore imran khan ashok lavasta journalists in india businessman in india it becomes more than apparent that this is the government of india and some government of india agency which has deployed pegasus now at this comes brings me to point number 3 whenever the government of india is asked in parliament or outside can you please confirm have you bought and used pegasus or not the government of india refuses to answer that question most recently when the matter of the use of pegasus against journalists and uh, rights activists and opposition figures was was taken to the supreme court in the form of a pil filed by multiple uh, journalist bodies the supreme court asked the government of india please file an affidavit on this question of have you bought pegasus or not 
and the government of india refused to file an affidavit so i would say based on its refusal to answer this question based on the range of people who have apparently been targeted using pegasus in india and pakistan is very clear that it is the modi government which has deployed pegasus in this fashion and here i want to add a fourth element of deductive reasoning which is that prime minister narendra modi makes a visit to israel in uh, july 2017 and most even though the database of numbers uh, there are more than 50000 numbers worldwide even though this database goes back to 2016 the vast majority of indian numbers start in the aftermath of mr modi's visit to israel so i would say based on all of these uh pieces of the puzzle the answer to the question which government used pegasus against the range of targets in india the bhima bhima koregaon people the chatisgarh activists various lawyers supreme court registrars journalists political figures and so on the answer to that question has to be the modi government and its agencies and here i should say that uh citizen lab which has looked at uh, the use of servers by the nso group has concluded that there are in fact two agencies in india which are using pegasus one it says looks only at targets in india and the other looks at targets in india and abroad and this also i submit fits the pattern that we have seen in our analysis of the database now the question is what does this mean what is the use of pegasus by the government of india against these range of targets mean for governance and for democracy before i answer that question i want to make one minor observation which is that on the assumption that i've got it wrong and that the government of india and its agencies are not the ones who have deployed pegasus against this range of targets in india based on what nso group has said that it only sells pegasus to governments the least that you would have expected from the government of india by now is some kind of inquiry to establish which foreign government has obtained pegasus and is using it in such a way against a range of indian targets including ministers including former head of the cbi including a former head of the bsf including a former member of the election commission if it's not the government of india surely the modi government which prides itself on being such an outspoken defender of national security in india surely the modi government would have taken steps to establish which government has targeted all these people in india but it has done nothing of the sort so i would say in action on the part of the government to find out whether in fact a foreign government a hostile government has used pegasus against targets in india is a further element of my deductive reasoning for why the targeting has been done by this government and its agencies now let's come to the consequences as i promised i began by saying in this lecture that the use of pegasus is alarming not simply because it represents an invasion of individual privacy so it's not just an assault on the privacy rights of a citizen but it also represents a threat to democracy and i think this is what i want to emphasize uh because when we look at india as a surveillance state this is not just a question of uh 
the secret service or politicians uh, indulging their peeping tom instincts uh, it's not that they are voyeurs who are who are anxious to know about our personal secrets my submission to you is that pegasus is being used as a weapon to further the political interests of the ruling bharatiya janata party simple and to support my claim i offer exhibit number 1 which is the forensic test that we conducted on the smartphone of prashant kishore prashant kishore as you know was the chief electoral strategist of um uh, west bengal chief minister mamta banerjee the state run the state elections this year were a keenly fought battle where prime minister narendra modi threw in everything he personally attended and addressed dozens of meetings and rallies despite covid and treated what was a state level assembly election as some kind of a referendum on his own government so anxious was he to dislodge mamta banerjee what does it mean that pegasus was used against prashant kishore in the midst of this election i submit that this represents at the very least a violation of the electoral code of conduct it's a violation of the representation of people's act i believe it constitutes a corrupt practice because public funds in the form of taxpayer money have been used to buy at a very great cost pegasus from a foreign company and a government agency has used this spyware purchased with public money on behalf of the private interest of the ruling party in order to understand all the secrets of an opposition strategist and thereby undermine the election campaign of a party that the bjp was trying to defeat i'm not saying this as surmise as guesswork as an allegation i'm saying this as established fact because we have forensic evidence of the presence of pegasus on prashant kishore's phone during the west bengal election we know that rahul gandhi also was targeted with pegasus during the 2019 uh period 2018 2019 in the run up to the 2019 lok sabha election and even after we know that many players important congress and janata dal secular politicians were targeted with pegasus in the days and weeks running up to the <coughs> toppling of the uh, uh congress jds coalition government in karnataka in 2019 all of this represents um acts of corruption violations of the prevention of corruption act because public money has been used to deliver personal political gain to those who are in power think a think a minute about what happened in the united states during the watergate scandal President Nixon was accused of authorizing a break in to plant listening devices in a campaign headquarters of the opposition Democratic Party in Washington in the run up to the 1972 election This was discovered uh, and investigated much later but finally Nixon had to quit We don't know whether Nixon used U.S. taxpayer money to pay for the burglars to go in and uh, try to spy on the Democratic Party. But the very fact that 
a sitting president could use illegal unfair surveillance methods on his opposition in the run up to an election was deemed to be an offense so grave that had nixon not resigned he would surely have been impeached what narendra modi has done in 2019 and in 2021 during the west bengal election is an offense far more grave than watergate because you have used pegasus against mamta banerjee's chief advisor in the midst of an election and you've used public money to do that you used public agencies nobody ever alleged or accused richard nixon of using the uh, the cia or the fbi to break into the watergate building and uh, try to spy on the democratic party here the prime minister has used intelligence agencies that are part of the government very very grave offense and one which shows the extent to which the ruling party is prepared to go in order to undermine the electoral prospects of its opposition and ensure that the level playing field that voters expect in an election is uh disrupted in your favor here i should add that it was perhaps not a coincidence that pegasus also appears to have been used against ashok lavasa who was the one election commissioner in 2019 during the 2019 campaign who took a stand that several of prime minister modi's speeches especially the one where he targeted the voters of wayanad in kerala on a communal basis violated the model code of conduct and represented an offense ashok lavasa was of course overruled so the election commission decided ultimately in modi's favor but it cannot be a coincidence that ashok lavasa's name also figures his number figures also figures in our database of potential targets of the use of pegasus so if you look at the kind of targeting if you look at the timing of the targeting you see that narendra modi is not satisfied with the huge advantage he already enjoys in terms of numbers in terms of money i haven't mentioned electoral bonds which represents a further subversion of the electoral process but not satisfied with all of these advantages mr modi goes one step further and deploys spyware that is officially at least as per the israeli government's claims and the and the manufacturers claims supposed to be used against terrorists and criminals and even in court the solicitor general was arguing that pegasus is something which concerns of surveillance concerns national security the way in which pegasus was used has nothing to do with national security in the case of prashant kishore in the case of journalists in the case of human rights activists but it has everything to do with giving the state giving the ruling party uh an advantage over its political rivals so this use of surveillance to not just invade the personal space of people you don't like not just to violate the individual's right to privacy but to actually use information that you gather in order to subvert the democratic process in order to subvert the electoral process represents the true danger that pegasus poses for indian democracy and india as a whole which is why it is vital that the supreme court of india which is currently seized of the matter get to the bottom of this scandal assign responsibility punish those who have violated the law in this fashion 
because unless this is done unless the ministers and officials who who used illegal surveillance means against political rivals of the bharatiya janata party both in in terms of elections in terms of media in terms of uh, activism and civil society activism and so on and so forth uh, unless this is investigated and the officials and ministers and politicians responsible are punished we are in a situation where it will become harder and harder to trust in the integrity of the indian electoral process mr modi has recently taken to describing india as the mother of all democracies frankly this is a tall claim if you go back in history because democracy as we know it is of much more recent vintage and for all the democratic impulses that existed in india in the past uh, there were plenty of other undemocratic impulses which also existed and which were dominant caste oppression for example the oppression of women <clears throat> the oppression of the poor people going back in history uh but leaving the historical aspect of india being the mother of all democracies aside how can india be the mother of democracy or the father of democracy or the child of democracy if elections can be compromised by a ruling party using pegasus against its political opponents um this is a question that civil society needs to debate this is a question that the supreme court needs to answer and based on we've seen from the uk high court ruling that no matter what claims are made about national security and so on and so forth it is possible for for judges to develop court craft to pierce the veil and get to the bottom of how the spyware is being used and i believe that it's only if the judiciary ensures full transparency on this matter that indian democracy in this era of surveillance can be safeguarded thank you very much